Jamie, don't you go too far, okay? Uh, Jenny and the family, if you guys want to come up. Father's Day, not really many, uh, much better time to do a baby dedication than a Father's Day or Mother's Day or something like that. So they, they bring Julianne up here this morning to, to dedicate her. And we might wonder, and, and the rest of the family, you're welcome to come as well. We might wonder, well, why, why, do, we do, uh, why do we do a dedication? What, uh, what's the biblical... Uh, scripture behind that. Well, you can look in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, and it reads, as, as Hannah was, was bringing Samuel to be dedicated to the temple, it, it reads, For this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition which I asked of him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. So we see Hannah bringing Samuel to be dedicated to the Lord in the temple. We see the parents of, of Jesus Christ here on earth, uh, Mary and Joseph, bringing him to the temple to be dedicated as well. Since we do that, how then should we teach our children? So I want to read these, these few verses to you from Deuteronomy chapter 5 through verse 9. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall write them. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. Shall talk to them. Talk of them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be on your frontals, on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and the gates. You need to keep the child in church. You need to remind them of Scripture. Well, what does Julianne's name mean in Scripture? Her name means youthful, guided by faith. Her verse is found in Matthew chapter 9, verse 29. It reads, He touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. So for her, it's according to your faith, let it be to you. That is the scripture and the verse, the meaning of her name. So as you lead her, as you dedicate her this morning, as you bring her before, uh, before us and before man and saying that, that this is important to you and that you're going to lead her in these ways, we want to pray for you and lift you up this morning. Father, such a wonderful family, a loving family, to hear their story, that you have blessed them, you have brought this miracle to them. Jamie has, has shared his testimony before the church and just praises God, gives God all glory for the joy that, that they hold in their hands today. Father, may you ever be before them, may you lead and guide them. May you guide their precious child in all of her days. Father, we look forward to the day when she accepts you. Your son, Jesus Christ, is her Lord and Savior. We'll celebrate with her again. So, Father, we entrust them with the gift that you've given. May we assist them and love them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. She says amen. Amen. Well, great. God bless you. God bless you. All right. You may be seated. As they're making their way back, I want to ask you guys to stay. Anybody know who Leo Tolstoy is? Jimmy surely does. Did you ever read that novel, War and Peace? You did? You read the whole thing. Holy cow. Has anybody else, else ever read War and Peace, cover to cover? Just the cover. <laughs> Just the cover. One of your students. J Jimmy, was it literature, English? Did you? He was at, at high school, high, high, middle school, middle school. Middle school English literature teacher there, so just, you know, it wasn't required reading in your class then. Well, as we know, War and Peace, one of the, lar one of the largest uh, novels, books, 
ever ever written, uh, not the largest, but but just so you know, uh, he's a Russian author uh, who wrote the, that novel. It, it has over 587,000 words in it, 14,000 plus pages, the biggest novel I've ever read, and I'm so proud of myself for reading this novel. Usually if it's beyond 150 pages and it's not just a three-quarter size book, I just go ahead and uh, set it to the side. But the largest book I've ever read was just over 660 pages. So proud of myself for reading that too. It was a book about Winston Churchill called Warlord. Go out, get it from the library. It's a good read. I can't speak for war and peace though. You'll have to ask Jimmy about that. But Tolstoy was a Christian. Uh, it was, this was around 1902. He tells a story to an, an, an interviewer, a reporter from a new New York newspaper. Uh, he had been on a trip uh, to the Caucasus Mountains. It was in the Caucasus Mountains, the area he went to is in far northeast part of Russia. He went there to see these, uh, these barbarian people as they actually called them there, but they, they, were, uh, they, they just stayed in this one area. They did not travel around. They did not move around. They had very little minimal interaction with outside people. They had little contact with anybody else. They never left. They never moved. Well, he came and he, he brought some stories of great men to them. They wanted to know, tell us about these great men. Tell us about some great men. They wanted to learn about others in different places. So Tolstoy goes in, he, he tells them about Frederick the Great, he tells them about Alexander the Great, he tells them about Napoleon, he goes on to tell them about other great uh, uh, statesmen and, and other great generals. And after a few hours of talking, Tolstoy gets tired. He gets a little exhausted. He sits down, and the chief of the tribe comes over to him and says, you haven't told us about the greatest man that we have ever heard of. He said, he's a man whose voice was like thunder and whose laughter is like sunrise. The chief says, this man lived in a faraway place called America, and if a young man was to leave on a journey for America, he would be old by the time he got there, he arrived, because America was so far away to them. The chief goes, he says, you haven't told us of this great man, Abraham Lincoln. So Tolstoy stands up, he shares what he knows about Lincoln. He shares of Lincoln's great failures. He shares of his uh, accomplishments. He shares of some of the grief in Lincoln's life. He shares of, of about the Civil War as well with these people. The reporter asked Tolstoy, he says, how did these people in this remote area know anything about Lincoln? Tolstoy said they knew two things about Lincoln. They knew of his personal integrity, and the second thing, they knew of his moral character. Lincoln had great loss in his life. His mother, who really formed his, his scriptural, his uh, spiritual foundation, died when he was nine years old. He had a sister die shortly after that as, as well. The great love of his life, Ann Rutledge, died as well. He failed in office time and time again, as you're familiar with the story of Lincoln, until just by happen chance, he just somehow happens to be elected president at the right time, the right man at the right time for the right position. But through his life, there was personal integrity and there was moral character that influenced his generation and influenced generations to come. Now, how can we as men have that kind of impact? We're in a study this month about men directed to you. How we can live a godly life in an ungodly day, an ungodly society. What can we learn? What is it about our character? What it is about our integrity? Do we have that in our life? 
Is it an example that others can live by? If somebody was to look at you today as these uh, barbarians did, as these people, these, these natives there in, these, in this Caucasus Mountain area, if they were to know you, would they see the same moral character and integrity in your life that they had heard about? Would that resonate with the people at your work? The people that you go to school with, would they know you as having this kind of character? What speaks when your name is mentioned? What images come to mind? How can we live? How can we have an impact on our society? How can we have an impact on our family? How can we have an impact in this day and time? Daniel chapter 1. Now if you were with us last week, I, I don't know how long it took. Uh, Brian, Brian was doing the lessons and it took him like three days to catch on that we were that Bible school was in Daniel, and we had been going through Daniel with, uh, with their study for this month. I'm just poking at you, Brian, but, uh, but no, seriously. The Bible school and what we're studying right now, they went, they went together like a glove, a, a hand in a glove. Just affirmation from God. I've shared with you times before little things like that, just how God affirms that we're doing, we're teaching, we're, we're on the right track. So it's great through Bible school that we're reinforcing each other. Here you have Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. At this time, these are young teens. Daniel may be 13 at, at this time. That, and they're removed from their home. We've talked about this. They're removed from their home. Just a little recap. They are taken in chains, marched, I'm sure, a thousand miles away from what they knew as their, as their residence, as their village, as their house. They're introduced to a new language. They don't know the language that these people speak. They're introduced to a whole new culture, a whole new world. But even in this mess, even in this uh, captivity, even in this pagan culture, they don't just survive, they thrive, and they thrive greatly. A couple of the reasons they thrive is through person, their character, and their integrity. Men, we need to have this kind of character. We need to have this kind of integrity in our lives if we're going to influence others for the glory of God. Last week, we looked at a couple of things. The first thing we looked at last week was conviction. Daniel and, and, and as you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had conviction in their life. Chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel made up his mind. It was something that was already done. He had determined in the past that at some point in the past, he had made up his mind, I will not defile my body. I will not eat the food that is given to these idols. We need to have conviction in our life. We need to have it determined right now. I told you, when lightning strikes, it's too late to jump. You need to know today how you will respond. The second thing we looked at last week was kindness. Daniel spoke with a kindness to this commander of the officials. Daniel had made up his mind he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials. Verse 12, Daniel says to the commander, please test your servants for, for 10 days. He's kind. He's got some compassion about him. He's not, uh, he's not gruff. He's not rough. He's not harsh with his words. Daniel has conviction. He has kindness. And because of that, look what happens in verse 9 and 10. Now, God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food, he's appointed your drink, for why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? 
then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. So this chief of the commanders, this guy, this general, this guy in charge of, of these kids, of, of Daniel and the others, Daniel has kindly made a request. Hey, you give us, don't make us eat this defiled meat, this defiled drink. You give us something else. Daniel's going to tell him what to give us. Give, it, give them. But the, but the commander, he says, I hear what you're saying, but why should I do that? Because if this fails, my head will be on a platter. The king will have my head. But Daniel, but Daniel says, look, I understand. I understand what you're up against. He says, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and just water to drink. Daniel says, look, I understand what you're up against. I completely hear you. I'm picking up what you're laying down. I, I, I understand this. He says, but just listen to me. It, it wasn't challenging as guys like to do. Guys like to challenge each other. It doesn't matter if you're shooting layups, free throws, three-pointers. If, if you're throwing little quarters at a line or if you're trying to throw a piece of lint out of your pocket in the wastebasket, there's a challenge when guys are involved. It's a competition. Amen. Chad's back there jumping up and down right now. He wants to know what the competition is. But guys are competitive. It's just our nature, I guess. It's the way I'm wired, maybe not all of us. But Daniel doesn't make this into a competitive thing. Daniel doesn't say, does, Daniel doesn't bow up and say, this is what you're going to have to do for us. No, he has this kindness, this compassion. He understands what this, what this commander is up against. He understands the hurdles, the situation, the obstacles that face them. Now, I'll stick with Chad. Use another example with Chad. If I was to challenge Chad, it would be like me going up to Chad and, and telling him, Chad, I see you got this camera right here. I saw you carry this camera around all through Bible school, and I, I know that's your profession and stuff, but, but let me tell you how to run that camera. <laughs> Chad, you got the backdrop all wrong. You, your lighting is poor, You've, you don't have the right lighting, you've got the lighting be behind you or in front of you and it needs to be over here at this angle and you, you really don't have the camera and zoom or focus and uh, you need to push these buttons over here and this is the way, you, you got this auto focus and really you can do it better over here if you've got this sports focus or whatever it is, you know, and, and Chad, you're just all out of focus here. Chad, just let me show you how to run that camera. I'll tell you what Chad would do with that camera, he'd probably hit me over the head with the camera. But no, no. If I went up to Chad and I said, Chad, you're an absolute genius with that camera. Chad, I've seen all the awards that you've won. The AP, Associated Press, whatever else awards he wins locally, statewide. Chad, I see these awards upon your wall, upon your desk here. I've, I've seen them posted. I, I've, and I congratulate you on that. Chad, I've got this idea. Here's my idea. What do you think about this, Chad? Is this something we can do? I tell you what Chad would say. Chad would say, sure, absolutely. Let's do that. Do you see the difference? If I went in with a competitive nature saying, I can do this better than you can, I'm not going to get anywhere. But if I go in with kindness, as Daniel does, I understand what you're up against. You go in with kindness, it changes the whole chemistry, the whole makeup of the conversation. So there's some conviction, and there's kindness. There was no challenge. There was no need to fly off the handle. The third thing that we see is evidence. There needs to be some confirmation. There needs to be some affirmation, some validation. Chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Daniel says, please test your servants for 10 days. And let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the presence of the youths who are eating the king's choice. See, there are already some that have given in. 
They've come over there. The best of the best has been hauled into Babylon, has been hauled into captivity, and there have been many that have given in to what society says. They've already acquiesced. They've already surrendered. They've already forfeited. But Daniel says, we're not going to do that. But give us time. Give us 10 days. Judge us against the other youths who are eating this food, food of the king's choice and, and dealing with your servants according to to what you see. Daniel says there'll be some evidence. You'll see an affirmation. You'll see some confirmation. You'll see that just give us some time. Now let me see. If I took, this, would, this is what it would be like. Think about this. If I took this half of the church this morning and said for the next 10 days, you guys get broccoli, cauliflower, and spinach. For 10 days, you'd lose some weight. I guarantee you you'd lose weight. I can almost guarantee you'd be grumpy too. Now if I took this side over here, if I took this side over here and I said, you get the choice steak. You get, you, you Josh back here shaking his head. He's all about the meat. He's a meat person. You get steak. You get beef. You're going to put on a little weight in 10 days. You're going to be a little more heavy than you are today. But you'll probably be a little more happy as well. That's what it would be like. It's a miracle what happens, what takes place in their body. It's a miracle of God. They should not come out the way they do. So let's look. There had to be some evidence Verse 14 and 15. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for these 10 days. At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better. And they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. Now notice what it says back there in verse 15. It says that, that their appearance seemed better. Not different. Not different. But better. Their appearance was was better. It was a miracle from God. Guys, we don't just need to be different. We need to be better. It is nothing for us to be. The world is different. We need to be better in the world. At work, we need to be better. It doesn't matter what your job is. You're a Christian. You're a believer. You need to be better. As a parent with children, you need to be better than the world. As a husband, you need to be better than the world is. We need to be better, not just different. And here's the fourth thing. We need to be able to identify false teaching. Men, the world has got some theories for us. The world has got some ideas. The world has got some opinions. But we need to be able to ID what is false. What the world is trying to sell us. Do you know how the federal government, I forget what they're called, but I, do you know how they identify counterfeit bills? There's, there's probably a million different ways to counterfeit money. But how does the government identify counterfeit bills? They take the original and they study the original. They pour themselves over the original bill. So when a, current, when a, when a, when a counterfeit currency is presented... They're able to look at that. They'll say, well, there's something different about this. This isn't the real thing. It's not genuine. I don't know what it is, but it's not right. It doesn't have the right flatness or the right gloss to it or the right sheen or the right dullness or the right texture. It doesn't have the right feel. There's something about it. It's just not right. We need to be able to identify false teaching. 
We need to know what the forgery is. We need to know scripture. So when the kid comes home from school, you can tell them that's not truth. When the kid comes home from science class and they've been teaching evolution all day, all week, all year, you can say, we don't believe that. That is not biblical. And here's why. Our kids go to an orthodontist and his, he has his old, his middle son, maybe youngest, I don't know. He has a son that is going to Murray State. He's still in high school, but he's taking a, a summer class at Murray State. It's a three-week class. I guess it's like Murray State's version of uh, Governor Scholar, something like that. And he's, he said this is going to be good for him. He'll get three weeks at this university with these teachers. He says, but when he comes home, and I forget what course he's studying while he's there. He says, but when he gets home, I'm going to have to be prepared to reteach what they taught. And that's the way in any, any university, any college, any school. Parents, we need to know what truth is. We need to be able to identify false teaching and say that's not biblical. But when we haven't poured over the scripture, when we don't know what the truth is, how can we ever stand up against that and protect children? We can't. We will not be equipped. 17. Verse 17. As for these four use, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Now, it breaks my heart to see what Christians embrace in the world and in society today. I already told you, Christians, Christians are just flocking toward the theory of, of evolution. And let me tell you, Evolution has never, the theory of evolution has never, ever, ever been proven, nor will it ever. And you say, well, you don't know what you're talking about. I absolutely do, because if you can go out and find one fossil of where one species jumped or morphed or transitioned, whatever you want to call it, from one thing to the next, then I, I might go along with you. But there has never been a fossil found where one species moved from one to the next. You can't find it. The burden is not on me to prove that the Bible is truth, that there is a single creator who spoke everything and it became into existence. The burden is on Darwinism or any other theory to prove itself because it hasn't done it yet. Christians embrace it, though. I don't know, are you familiar with what the Supreme Court just... I, I suppose it's true. The Supreme Court just, just this week, I guess... There was some kind of vote or something that came up about Jerusalem being the capital of Israel. Some dude has argued about a passport that he claimed Jerusalem to be his capital, to be his home city, and it was part of Israel. And our Supreme Court has said no. Palestinian territory, I guess. But anyway, we're ready to sell Israel out. There are repercussions to that. We need to be able to identify truth. And the last thing, community. We need to have a place of community, men. We need to have a place where brothers can come together, where we can share, where we can be honest, where we can be open. This is the second time I've told you about this. We need to be able to do things. We need to be able to feel comfortable with one another, to lean on one another. Look at verse 19. These four guys had each other. The king talked with them, and out of them, out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's presence personal service. These four guys had been supporting each other. They needed each other. 
if, if one of us is cut off from the herd, there is more than likely we are going to wither up spiritually. If one of us ever gets cut off, if one of us ever checks out of church, we will wither up spiritually. These guys had one another. We need one another. We need community in our life. Guys, you need to be with us when we do things like go play golf. You say, well, I'm not a golfer. I'm not a golfer either, but I'm going to go. You need to be, you say, well, I, I just, I'm, I don't like being out in the sun. I got this pale white skin. I don't take good to, that's okay. All right. We're going to go shoot skeet this fall. Just right across the road. Maybe next year, maybe next year we'll go take in a miners gang together or something like that. Maybe next year we'll go over to the lake and we'll have a, a, a largest bluegill fishing contest. And then you cook what you eat. No, that's not what I meant. You No, no, no. You eat what you catch. That's what I meant. You eat. I want to borrow some, Jimmy. But you need to be with us when we do things like that. You need to be involved. There needs to be community. You need to be in Sunday school. It's not a wasted hour. You need to see it as a priority. So next Sunday, don't you hit the snooze button. Don't you sleep in. Get out of the bed. Get away from the TV. Don't think, well, I've got, to, I've, don't let the chores overwhelm you. You make it a priority. You bring yourself, you bring your wife, you bring the family into Sunday school. It will make a difference in your life. And women, if he doesn't do it, you get up and you come without him. If we want to make an impact and have an influence for the glory of God, we need to have these things in our life. We need to have some conviction. We need to have kindness. There needs to be evidence of it. We need to be able to ID false teaching. And then we need to have some community. We get some of that working for us. You'll begin to see some things different. Your priorities will change. Give it a chance. See if it makes a difference in your life. Let's pray.